Jesus, yesterday, today, forever, you're the same. This world is changing. Our lives change, our circumstances change. And we need to build our lives on something that doesn't change, and you're it. And so we praise you today that we can worship you. And as we think about your unchanging nature, may that give us a rock to lean on today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Thank you, lead worshipers, for leading us this morning. Uh, We should thank you more than we do, but we thank you today for leading us and taking us musically uh, into the praise of our God. I'm constantly surprised by words in our culture. Every once in a while, a word will just pop up out of the dictionary and all of a sudden we start to use it over and over and over again. Uh, A couple years ago, the word epic popped up. I don't know if you remember that word uh, a few years ago, but all of a sudden, any experience had to be epic. If it wasn't an epic experience. It wasn't a good experience at all. And uh, this year, I've been surprised by a word, and it's actually been coming up for the last several words, or, or the last several years, and the word is trending. I don't know if you've noticed that. It used to be just in election years, we would see the word trending. And if a politician that was running for office was trending, that was a good thing. But now, Because we have these opportunities to get instant uh, influence from people, uh, the word trending is used of all kinds of things. Uh, I saw recently that iPhones are trending down. I I saw recently that a person who was running for office was trending up. And so trending is this word that has all of a sudden become a part of the dictionary of our everyday lives. And this morning, I want to take you to a passage in Joshua, chapter 16 and chapter 17. And if using one of our Bibles uh, that you find in the room here, it's on page 190. But in Joshua, chapters 16 and 17, there are some trends. And I want to tell you about some things that are trending in Joshua chapter 16 and Joshua chapter 17. Faith in God is trending down. Trust in God is trending down. The popularity of God is trending down. Now there are some things that are trending up as well. Discouragement, laziness, lethargy. So we come to these passages and see that there is a downward trend. And hopefully you will see that that is not a good thing. Uh, The things that are trending down anyway and the things that are trending up are not good things. And yet as we come to these chapters this morning, God is no less powerful regardless of what things are trending than he is at any other point in time because it's who he is. Yesterday, today, forever. He's the same. He doesn't change. And so this morning, I invite you to look with me at Joshua chapters 16 and 17. If you are a guest this morning, if you haven't been here for the last several weeks, we are going through the book of Joshua. And it's an interesting study because we find that God promised land to his people way back in history. And it took a long time, but God keeps his promises. And so now the people of Israel are possessing the land that God gave them. And we're finding out some interesting things about how this is happening. 
it isn't going according to the way that we might have planned it would go. But nonetheless, there are some great lessons for us as we look at these chapters. Uh, I want to look first at the first four verses of Joshua chapter 16. And if you wanted to put a banner over these verses, you could say that these verses are proof of Psalm 115.3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Let me read those first four verses for you and see if you notice something important. The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. Then going from Bethel to Luz, it passes along Adaroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Japhelites, Japhelite, Japhelites, as far as the territory of lower Beth Horon, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. The people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. There's something interesting going on in this passage. As you look at the way that our author writes these words, the sons of Joseph are mentioned in birth order. But in verse 5, the author tells us first about how the tribe of Ephraim received their inheritance. So, the sons are listed in birth order, which is the way you're supposed to do it. First son first, second son second. And then we are told that Ephraim gets the inheritance first. I don't think that's an accident. I think the author of the book of Joshua is reminding us that our God is in heaven and he does what he pleases. And the way that he does things doesn't always fit into a nice little box that makes a whole lot of sense to us. And I want to take you back to Genesis 48. Joseph had these two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Note the birth order. And he brought these two sons before his elderly father to receive a blessing. This was tradition in the day. And so Joseph was doing that. But it's interesting that when Jacob mentions these two boys, he says that Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. Note, this is opposite the birth order. So Joseph places and presents his boys for Jacob's blessing. He places Manasseh, the older, opposite Jacob's right hand, which was natural, and Ephraim, opposite Jacob's left hand. So what does Jacob do? He crosses his hands. And this is, this is a crazy scene. And he placed his right hand on Ephraim's head, giving him the priority. Joseph sees this mistake, and so he's sitting there trying to change it and trying to make it right, because this isn't the way it goes. The older son gets the blessing from the father's father on the, by the father's right hand, and, and Joseph is here scrambling, oh, this is going to be a big mistake. The, the wrong kid's going to get the wrong blessing. But Jacob let his son know that he was fully aware of what he was doing. And in Genesis 48, 20, we read, So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. <laughs> this reminds us, and Joshua 16 reminds us, that God is not bound by conventional wisdom. He's not bound by the way that we always do things. He's not bound by societal norms. God does what he pleases for his glory. And by the way, aren't we glad? I look at this group, I love you all. I really do. But if you are going to start a movement in our area of this city, 
to change this city forever for the glory of God, I wouldn't necessarily choose all of us. Would you? God doesn't need the best and the brightest. The bottom line is the gospel. God created this world. Mankind through Adam rebelled and sinned. And there's this separation between God and man. We see it all over the place. That separation between God and men is messing up everything. And there's one way to God and it's through Jesus. And you don't need to have a certain amount of money in your checkbook in order to believe in Jesus and become a follower of Jesus Christ. This good news of the gospel is not limited to people with a certain skin color or certain job title or royal blood in their veins. I think of 1 Corinthians 1, 26. Consider your calling, brothers, Paul writes. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. In choosing us to be his people, his church, God didn't choose the best and the brightest, and aren't we glad? In the middle of chapters 16 and 17, There's this overall downward trend of trust in God and faith in God. And generally we're going to see that continuing until the end of the book of Joshua. But there's one little bright spot. One little upward trend that I would like us to look at for just a few moments this morning. It comes in Joshua 17 verses 3 through 6. Weird story here. And again, I, uh, I've already messed up a couple of words this morning, and I'll probably mess up in this particular passage. Um, so please keep your giggles to yourself. Now, Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Macher, son of Manasseh, had no sons but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters. Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Terzah. They approached Eliezer, the priest, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the leaders, and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. Thus there fell to Manasseh ten portions, besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is on the other side of the Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh. Now there's an, inter- there's an interesting background to this small section. It goes back to Numbers, book of, book of Numbers chapters 27 and 36. Zelophehad died and he had no sons. So his five daughters came to Moses and they asked to be given the inheritance that would have normally been given to the sons in the family. Now, we know that even in the days of Jesus, the society was very male-dominated. Women had very little influence, very few rights. It was a male-dominated culture. And here, at this point in history, it's even more male-dominated than it was in the days of Jesus. And so this is a wild request. This you would guess, would just never happen. Well, tough luck, girls. Tough luck. That's that's not the way it works. Guys get all the land, and if you've got no living brothers, then it goes to the closest male relative. Tough luck, you know. Sorry, you were born a woman. What can we do about it? But these girls went 
to Moses. Moses <laughs> didn't know what to do, so he referred the situation to the only one who could handle it, God himself. And God decided in the favor of these girls. And so the daughters of Zelophehad, as women of faith, were given the inheritance that would have normally gone to their brothers. And so here they come in faith, boldly coming to Eliezer and Joshua, and they asked for only that which God had already promised them. How many times do we stand back and not go for the promise? I, I was uh, in a small store last summer, and it was a slow time of the day, and so I walked into the store, and there was one of those bells that you're supposed to ring, and I hated to ring the bell, because it was like, oh, I don't want to bother anybody, and I thought, how ridiculous is this? I'm going to ring a bell so that somebody comes out and I give them my money. You know, obviously they want me to ring the bell. But I feel, ah, oh, I don't really want to bother anybody here. And I think sometimes that that's what the author to the Hebrews is getting at in chapter 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God is sufficient. God is adequate for every circumstance in life that we face. And as we walk by faith, why don't we just ring the bell of faith and pray? <laughs> why don't we just ring the bell? But so many times, unlike these daughters, we stand back and we don't go boldly before God and say, God, <clears throat> would you do what you have promised that you would do? I, I think of Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission. God there says, I will be with you always. When you feel alone, when you feel like you are up against a wall, when you are feeling that you have absolutely no power, why don't you pray and ask God to keep his word and to be with you at that moment in time? And yet so often, we are hesitant to go to God in prayer and ask him for things that he has told us that he will do. Well, the, the, the trending in this book is going down. And trust in God, confidence in God, faith in God is trending down. And we see these clouds on the horizon. And they start popping up in the seventh verse of the 17th chapter of Joshua. The territory of Manasseh reached from Asher to Mikmetha. <laughs> Try saying that fast 50 times which is east of Shechem. Then the boundary goes along southward to the inhabitants of En Tapua. The land of Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but the town of Tapua on the boundary of Manasseh belonged to the people of Ephraim. Then the boundary went down to the brook of Cana. These cities to the south of the brook among the cities of Manasseh belonged to Ephraim. Then the boundary of Manasseh goes on the north side of the brook and ends at the sea. The land to the south being Ephraim's, and that to the north being Manasseh's, with the sea forming its boundary. On the north, Asher is reached, and on the east, Issachar. Also in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Beth Sheen and its villages, and Iblim and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Endor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Taanak and its villages, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages, the third is Napheth. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of these cities 
But the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in the land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. In the book of Judges, if you read the book, you can see the full-blown problem When the people of Israel did not obey God and drive the enemies of the land out altogether, it meant that they left the enemies there to influence them. And in Judges, it becomes a full-blown problem. And this little group of inhabitants of the old population of the promised land had an influence far beyond what they should have. And at the end of Judges, it's a mess. But right now, we just get these glimpses of these clouds that are out there on the horizon. And it started back in chapter 15. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. 16.10, however, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived at Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Then 17, 12, and 13, the people of Manasseh could not take possession of the cities. The Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Now, as we look at those verses, we see that God told Israel time and time again, drive the enemy out altogether. No compromise. God had been patient with the people of Canaan. There had been sin and sin and sin, and God had been patient for hundreds of years. And now, God's Purposes were for his people to be his arm, driving these people out of the promised land. But the people of Israel let a few folks remain, and gradually the message of those folks who worshipped the god Baal began to appeal to them. Wow, Baal's got some cool things to say about sex. That's kind of... That's kind of neat. Um, Let's listen to that. Wow, let's, you know, maybe we could keep our God kind of over here and we could kind of do some Baal worship over here. All of a sudden, the false God Baal was the God of many people. In Exodus 23, Deuteronomy 7, God told his people that the enemy would be driven out little by little until Israel had the entire land, but the people quickly lost the vision of God in taking this land that was promised. And the sin of the people here was double. It wasn't that they disobeyed God only and didn't drive the people out. They then turned around and they took the people that they didn't drive out and they made them slaves so that they would have more money. Again, not trusting God to supply for their needs. So it ended up being a double sin for the people who were standing on the cusp of getting all that God had promised. Now, before we start picking up rocks to throw at these ridiculously stupid people in the Old Testament, let's look inside us. How many of you here, as men, have ever been to a, one of the big Promise Keeper events? How many of you women have ever been to one of the big Women of Faith events? You know, those events are fantastic. But they're pretty easy. To stand at a promise keeper's event and say, I believe in God, let's sing his praise. When you've got 70,000 guys there backing you up, that's easy. To be at a women of faith event and have a speaker stand up and say, let's all submit to our husbands. I don't know, do they say that at those events? I don't know. 
But whatever they say at the Women of Faith event, um, it's, it's easy to, yes, yes, yes. But the hard part is on Monday morning getting into your car by yourself and going to work where you may be the only follower of Jesus Christ. And what was happening here in Israel is that they had been this huge nation. Hey, let's go take this. Let's go take this. Well, now they were divided up. They still had a good number of folks, but it wasn't nearly the huge mob that they had earlier. And as they broke up and as they weren't together as this huge mob, all of a sudden they were getting weaker in their faith. I think of Jesus' parable of the soils and the seed. Remember that? He talked about a a sower throwing seed all over the place. And he talked about the seed that was falling on rocky ground. And Jesus said, these are the ones who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. God is sufficient and adequate for every situation in life that we face. Whether we're at a promise keepers event, whether we're at a woman of faith event, whether we're at a huge challenge youth conference, wherever we are, God is sufficient and adequate. That means that when we leave those events and we go to our school by ourselves and we go to our jobs by ourselves, when we are at King Supers with a small men's group, whatever the situation, God is as powerful then as he was when we were in the big group. The last downward trend we're going to look at this morning could be entitled... Ephraim, Manasseh, and Eeyore. Then the people of Joseph, two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, spoke to Joseph saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, although I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me? And Joshua said to them, If you are a numerous people, go up to yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Raphim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. The people of Joseph said, The hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell on the plain have chariots of iron, but those in Beth Sheen and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, You are a numerous people and have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. The final picture of these two chapters is a picture of discontentment. The two Joseph tribes refer to themselves as a numerous people. You see that popping up in this little section? A numerous people, a numerous people. Uh, This is sort of like a boast. This is sort of like bragging. It's as if the two tribes are saying, well, God must really like us since he made so many of us. That's really what they're saying. We're a numerous people. We're, there's a lot of us, so we must be important. And, and obviously, that's kind of the logic that we see in a lot of life, isn't it? Well, there's more of us than you, and so, you know, we're going to take control. We must be important. But they're complaining. There's so many of us, and we're obviously a blessed people Why do we only get a little bit of land? Why do we only get one portion of land? So Joshua tries to speak sense to them. says, hey, go up to the forest and clear a place for yourselves. Since there are so many of you, go make a big place. The people show their true attitude. Even cleared out. The hill country isn't enough. The enemy's 
living in the land down on the plains have chariots. And that's kind of a hard thing to overcome. And they don't really want to do that. These people aren't happy with the gift of God. They are not content with his gifts. They are not thankful for the gift. They have no gratitude. And they are sort of like Eeyore. I wasn't real familiar with this philosophy of Eeyore until I had children and got involved in the land of Winnie the Pooh. And in the Winnie the Pooh land, Eeyore is a friend. And he is generally characterized as pessimistic and gloomy, an old gray stuffed donkey who isn't very happy, who basically grumbles about everything. And Joshua's words in verses 17 and 18 could be paraphrased. You are a numerous people. You have great power. You will not have only one lot for the hill country will be yours. Sure, it's a forest and you'll clear it out and its borders will be yours. Indeed, you will drive the Canaanites out. Sure, they have chariots. Sure, they're strong. But we have God. And God's already addressed this in Deuteronomy 17. If you say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. God is sufficient and adequate for every situation and every circumstance that we face. Walk by faith. Walk by faith. Well, as we look at this passage and we look at the trending of this passage. Faith in God, trust in God is trending down. Laziness, lethargy, and discontentment is trending up. How is Calvary Church trending? And when I say that, you know that I'm talking about us. I'm talking about you. Calvary Church is people. How do we react to God's unpredictability? God's ways over our history here at Calvary Church have not been easily understood, have they? Uh, If you're going to work in an area to try to change it for the glory of God. The ways of God at Calvary have not necessarily been the way that any of us would have chosen. How do you respond to God's unpredictability? Are we able to turn our thoughts about that unpredictability back to praise? Do we look at the Psalm 115 and say, praise God, we don't worship a God in a box. We worship a God who does what he pleases. How do we react to difficult situations we face? Many of you were raised on a hymn that says, take it to the Lord in prayer. How many of you know that phrase? Lots and lots of you knew. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And yet the average Christian in America spends two and a half minutes a day praying. You know what that is? That's basically crying out in traffic. Help me get home by five. Help me not be like, that's just basically screaming at God when we're in trouble. Just these little phrases. We have Jesus, the great high priest who understands every situation that we are going through and yet we just throw little phrases out at him when we need a rescue at the moment. We don't talk to him about things. We don't approach him about what he's already promised to do for us. And how are we when it comes to obeying God completely? Do we follow God's directions but make a few allowances because it really doesn't make sense in our culture today? 
Does the gospel have deep roots that go down into your life practices? Today, right now, are you content with God and his provision for your life? Or are you a grumbler? Are you an Eeyore? You know, we can even grumble about our church, can't we? But the amazing thing and the sobering thing about being a grumbler is this. God hates grumbling! In the Old Testament, time and time again, God hates it! And we might look at that, well, hey, what, what's the big deal with grumbling? Why would God hate grumbling? Because when we grumble, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are saying, God, I don't like what you're doing. I don't like the way that you're dealing with me in my life, which means I don't like you. That infuriates God. Grumbling and dissatisfaction and discontent is a big deal. God is sufficient and adequate for every circumstance in life that we face. So walk by faith in him, even when you feel small, even when you're alone. I was reading a, a book by Michael Horton recently, and he was quoting an author who said, you know, I don't have a problem trusting God with hurricanes and tornadoes. I have trouble trusting God with the everydayness. And you know, I think a lot of us can resonate with that. Tornadoes and twisters and hurricanes are big and powerful. Trusting God in those situations is normal for many of us, but it's the everydayness. It's when the person in the cubicle next to you is throwing pencils at your head. It's when you've got a teacher who doesn't really care about you, you're just a number. God is sufficient and adequate for every circumstance in life that we face. Walk by faith in him, even when you feel small, even when you're alone. Gracious God, thank you that you never change. So we've looked at these two chapters of scripture. Uh, we see the downward trend. And God, may these passages drive us upward as we see the disaster that comes when we don't trust, when we don't walk by faith, when we grumble. God, may we trend upward. May we go to you. May we desire to trust you more, walk by faith more, pray more, grumble less. Jesus, we thank you that you never change. Yesterday, today, forever, you're the same. May we build our lives on this rock. Amen.